All right, today we're going to talk about 7C, or intermolecular forces. Um, we're going to talk about forces, we're going to talk about molecules, and we're going to kind of define these different things here. So if we back up here, let's first talk about vocabulary. We're going to separate it into intra versus inter um, for forces. And intra molecular forces occur inside molecules. They actually hold the atoms together within a molecule, okay? And so this is going to be right here. It's typically a covalent bond, and that is going to be our intramolecular forces. I always like to think, remember it as intramurals are held or sports between within the same school. So again, there's my arrow. Okay, now intermolecular forces are going to occur between different molecules. All right, so here comes the arrow for this one. Here are the intermolecular attractions that occur between different molecules. Okay, they actually hold them together. And what happens is, remember, we've, we've seen this term because when we talked about phase changes, we talked about um, our vertical arrangement where we had gases, liquids, and solids. And up top, we had very high kinetic energy and very low attractive forces. Okay, so where it says gets weaker as phase changes from solid to a liquid to a gas, this is what we're talking about. These high, the gases that had very high kinetic energy had very low forces, okay, because they're so far apart, and then whereas the solids had much higher attractive forces, it holds those molecules together. So we've talked about the concept, we just didn't define it. Now when a substance changes state, a molecule stays together, but intermolecular forces, um, I guess really should say change, not necessarily weaken, because it just depends if you're endothermic and you're moving up the chain, or exothermic and you're moving down the chain, and that's all simply because this is a physical change. Okay, if it's a change of state, it's a physical change, it's not a chemical change. Now we're going to focus on intermolecular forces, which we're going to abbreviate as IMFs. So again, we're talking about different molecules. Okay, so, and there's three types that we're going to define. We're going to have what are called dipole-dipole attractions. We're going to have what's called hydrogen bonding, which I really strongly dislike this name because it misleads us into thinking that it's a traditional type of bond, which it is not. And then finally, you've got what are called London dispersion forces. Okay? Now, dipole or dipole moments will cause dipole-dipole attractions. So, first of all, let's define a dipole. A dipole is going to be a molecule or part of a molecule that contains a positively and a negatively charged region. And if this happens, we refer to it as what's called a dipole moment. Now, why? how do we know if this is going to take place? We've seen this concept before because we've talked about um, this really happens a lot of times if you have a polar covalent bond. Okay, so if you look at these two, if we talk about electronegativity and the electron tug of war, chlorine is more electronegative. So it's going to pull the electron over to its side. And we use these fancy symbols to, to designate, um, you know, the charges, but ultimately chlorine is more electronegative. It's going to win the tug of war a little bit. Hydrogen's going to lose out because it's less electronegative. And so we refer to this as being a dipole or having a dipole dipole or having a dipole moment, okay? Now, to determine if something will be polar or nonpolar, and we'll do some practice on this in class, we'll look at a lot of different molecules to determine them, is going to be based on a couple of things, okay? Number one, if a dipole moment exists, okay? So that is simply, is there a polar bond? Okay, and then also the molecular shape, and this is going to be indicative of the fact as if there are lone pairs, if there are not lone pairs, et cetera, et cetera. So there's going to be a few different things we have to take into account. So let's let's look at some examples and see if it helps to make sense of this. Okay, nonpolar molecules. One, it's going to be um, two things that have a very low difference in electronegativity. However, they may be some large differences, okay, there may be dipole moments, but di they can also cancel out. For example, we know fluorine is the most electronegative atom. So there's going to be three dipole moments. However, they're what we refer to as symmetrical, and they all cancel each other out. So they also, there also can be a situation where a polar, polar bond exists, but they cancel out. There's no, there's no part that's more negative than the rest. Okay, now also, if we look at polar molecules, well, this is a situation where you either have dipole moments that are asymmetrical and they don't cancel, or you have lone pairs 
are in the central atom. And I know that may be a little bit tough to see, but its lone pairs are present on the central atom. So for example, this is the water molecule. Now oxygen is more electronegative than, than hydrogen, so there's going to be some polarity here. But you also have these two lone pairs, okay, which means that oxygen is really going to be, this side's going to be negative, okay, and then we're going to have the regions that are positive near the hydrogen. And we're actually going to watch a video in class that just focuses on the special forces that water has um, based on this arrangement. And I know that this is the correct geometry because if we think about molecular geometry here, two lone pairs and two bonding groups gives us a bent structure of um, 104.5 degrees. So that's why I know it's drawn this way with the two lone pairs up here as opposed to a linear arrangement where the bond angle would be 180. All right, so polar molecules are either going to have asymmetrical shape, meaning lone pairs, and we kind of need to asterisk this just a little bit. Let me see if I can do this correctly here. Try to change the color. Um, and when we say lone pairs, it needs to be lone pairs off of, off of the central atom, because a lot of times people will look at a molecule, see any lone pair, and go, oh, it's automatically polar. And that's not necessarily the case. So you got to have lone pairs off of the central atom, or you need to have asymmetrical atoms. So for example, down here, you have, this would be um, uh, an organic compound that we're not going to be responsible for naming right now, so I'm not even going to go there. Um, but you've got a central carbon right here, and you have three chlorines, that are all more electronegative than carbon, and they also all have lone pairs. And now, since hydrogen is up here, this is going to be a polar bond, and the net dipole moment would be in this direction. If, let's just say, for example, we got rid of the hydrogen, and all of a sudden it was a chlorine, then it would turn it into a nonpolar molecule. But the way that it's written right now, with the hydrogen, it would be polar. Okay, it would be polar with the hydrogen in there. Okay, now hydrogen bonding is a special type of intermolecular force. And again, I don't like the fact that they use bonding in here, but I can't change it. Um, this is intermolecular force where a hydrogen atom is bonded to a highly electronegative atom and is attracted to an unshared pair of electrons in a nearby molecule. Okay, now I know that that's kind of wordy, um, and this typically occurs when you have hydrogen and it's bonded to either oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine, because they're really the big three in terms of electronegativity. And it's not really another type of bond. Um, when we say bond, traditional bond, that's usually going to be your covalent bonds, your ionic bonds, and your metallic bonds, but it really is only an intermolecular force, so it is a little bit misleading in that respect. And it's the strongest type of intermolecular force. It really is an example of a dipole-dipole attraction. It's just a, a really strong type of dipole-dipole attraction. So therefore, it kind of gets its own fancy name. Now, let's just quickly look at a few examples. Dipole-dipole um, -dipole attraction is going to be simply when the molecules with dipole moments line up to minimize uh, repulsion and maximize attraction. Or in other words, the positives line up with the negatives. And that's how they orient themselves. Um, around here so that you always end up with as many positive and negatives kind of lining up. It's kind of like magnets. Um, intermolecular forces are also very weak when they're compared to covalent and ionic bonds um, as well as metallic we should throw in here. And we're going to do some comparison um, charts of this stuff in class. Now hydrogen bonding is very important for a couple reasons. One, it happens in DNA. It's what holds the double helixes together. If you've blocked that out, the double helix is the <laughs> shape of the DNA molecule. Um, and here you have all these red dots where you have attraction between um, hydrogen and oxygen. And that's going to be the, it's not kind of bypassing the carbon there, that's a little misleading. But what are called intra, again molecular, or IMFs, hydrogen bonding. And hydrogen bonding in water is very important. Uh, if we think about the, here's our little, you know, water molecule. Let me get back to a different color that we can see here. And here is the negative end because of the oxygen. Here is the positive end, and that's why you've got the positives and the negatives kind of lining up. And they're going to align themselves so that positive and that negative is opposite each other, and that's what gives water its arrangement, whether it be in, um, particularly in ice, um, or how it orients itself for a lot of different things, and it's a hugely important molecule for living 
um, systems in living um, organisms. And we'll, again, we'll see a quick video on that in class as well. All right, the last one, the third type of IMF, is what's called London Dispersion Forces. Um, it is capitalized, a little grammar lesson here. Um, if you're going to write this in a sentence, okay, hydrogen bonding does not get capitalized if you're spelling out the word hydrogen. Dipole dipole does not get capitalized. However, the word London does get capitalized here because it was discovered in London. So not the dispersion forces part, but uh, if we do a write-up on this, I guarantee someone's going to mess it up and I'll correct them. So anyway, it's, it happens in every molecular compound. Um, it's only intermolecular, it's the only, it, excuse me, it is the only intermolecular present in nonpolar molecules and noble gas atoms because to this point, we've talked a lot about these dipoles and these positives and negatives, but we haven't really talked a ton about nonpolar. So nonpolar and noble gas atoms are going to have London dispersion is the only one that are present. They are very weak intermolecular forces and they're short-lived. They're technically around in every molecular compound, but dipole-dipole and hydrogen bonding is just much stronger. And it's really just a temporary dipole due to electron location. So in other words, if I had, oh, let's see, two hydrogen atoms bonded together, okay? Now, two hydrogen atoms have two electrons. Right, and so we have simplified this and drawn it that way and drawn them in between there and then we simplified it even further and we just said, oh, actually we're just going to call these a single bond right in the middle. But the reality of this is that if they're being shared, let me see if I can do a really bad drawing here and try to illustrate this. If they're being shared, those two electrons are really floating around anywhere in that orbital. Okay, because if we really start to connect here, we've got a 1s orbital for this hydrogen got a 1s orbital for this hydrogen and they kind of overlap. I guess you can kind of think of it as a Venn diagram. And if these are my electrons, they are floating around all over the place. Remember we talked about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that electrons move so fast that you can't tell where they are. It's my bad version of how fast electrons move. So in other words, if you end up with, in theory, let's say that for a moment both electrons end up Oh, uh, let's just say they both randomly end up uh, around this one because this one's still left. Okay, well this is going to form a very temporary dipole situation where this side of the molecule is negative and this side is positive. As soon as it occurs, the electrons start moving again and it's gone, but that's my really bad version of London dispersion. I'll try to find a better um, analysis for you later. Um, here is, uh, you know, again, here's my maybe a better version here, but no polarization is when the, they are even, the electrons are evenly distributed. You get an instantaneous dipole where you get just the flow of the electrons being on one side versus the other. Okay, just kind of like what I tried to draw. And then what happens is this dipole will then attract, affect this molecule over here, cause its electron to come over on this side, and so it kind of induces another dipole, and it's kind of this chain reaction thing. Uh, the mechanisms aren't hugely important, but we should know the definitions and be able to kind of explain what they are. So I hope.